it going. Let's check this guy. Even though this guy didn't even lose last time. I still haven't added him yet, but this would just be a cool thing. Alright. Okay. Which one is which one are we call in our main camera now? You still want that one? Okay. Alright, uh Do I lead off or do we lead off? <clears throat> you can lay off. Okay. Alright, let's go. Welcome to Two Bears and a Podcast, episode three with Brad and Mike, two marketing guys with a love of great craft beer and the stories that go with them. I'm Brad, the word guy. And I'm Mike, the visual guy. And this show is all about the experience of beer from the label to the glass, from the brew house to the bar. And each week we feature two beers we feel have something to say or that we think is wor- are worth saying something about. So this week we're looking at some farmhouse styles slash Saison. Uh, with Off Colors, Apex Predator, and Goose Island's uh, Sophie. And I was originally expecting to do um, Off Color first, but we were talking a little bit beforehand about how uh, Off Color is really doing a lot of niche niche stuff, uh, whereas Goose is obviously very mainstream uh, with a lot of their stuff and is possibly more likely to uh, contributed the commodification of beer, certainly not off color is. Uh, so maybe we'll start with Sophie and talk about a kind of uh, a sort of uh, heritage brand, uh, let's say, with Goose Island, um, and then look at sort of a, a recent upstart. Sounds good to me. All right. <clears throat> Goose. Does that come off? So their Instagram, 145,000 followers for Goose. They are definitely, people are paying attention. Um, We did just pass 312 day, March 12th. Yeah, they had a lot of promotion for that. That is, you know, leading up to it. Oh, it looks like they had a nice, uh, the special black can. That's their dry hopped 312, which I've not had a chance to try. Um, the 312 brand is obviously a very popular one, um, especially in Chicago, uh, and partly because it makes this direct reference to the area code, and um, and it is an easy drinking wheat, and it was never my favorite of theirs. I still would re- rather have their IPA or a Sophie, um, or even a Honkers. Say Honkers uh, is good. Yeah, uh, they're four-star pills I like. Yeah, I'll often reach for that um, when I'm looking at a variety pack. Uh, but yeah, I know people love 312, which is good for them. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. Smell that yeast. Mm-hmm. Peppery, lemony. Oh yeah, that's a bite. That's a peppery bite. Mm-hmm. With a little lemon aftertaste, I would say. Right? Is that how you characterize that? Characterize that? Yeah, I, I, I'm getting pepper all the way through. Um, it's certainly like yeah there's a little shout of lemon in there and it's it feels very carbonated yeah uh let me it looks kind of carbonated uh but yet it's still uh, it drinks light it's six and a half percent it's not it's right in the normal to middle um craft range right and this i'm trying to look at what it said on the this has been one of those, uh, yeah. It is, it is hand, has hand-zested orange peel in it and then partially aged in wine barrels. I believe they use champagne yeast. Uh, so this is interesting, I think, partly in that it's interesting to see Goose doing these, the Sophie and Matilda and Juliet and all them. Uh, because it does show their commitment to the the craft and the tradition mm-hmm. of brewing, uh, especially because you know, famously, I was you know they when they sold the AB InBev, a lot of people felt betrayed. It was like this huge deal. Uh, I was actually looking at a timeline on Vinepair of acquisitions, mm-hmm. and it goes 
So the goose sale was in 2011. Uh, this timeline started in 1988 with lining kugels. Oh. And it just, and just, I mean, there were, there were several dozen, I think, before Goose was acquired. So you know, I was trying to, like, think back to that time and remember, like, what was it about Goose that, like, was so upsetting that wasn't true when Pyramid sold or uh, Portland Brewing or Bridgeport. And I'm thinking of uh, these breweries I recognized from the time I was living in Portland. Uh, you know, but, but Goose Island was just really upsetting to a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, of course... Chicago people, <laughs> and that that might have you were in Chicago it, when that was when they were bought. Um, Twenty eleven. Where was I? Yeah, I was back in Chicago then, so that might have been part of it. Could have been a bigger impact. Yeah, just with that, I remember that was when I was doing a lot of the first Thursdays that they would have at the Goose Island Brew Pub, and uh, it was basically where home brewers would go and just general beer people would go and bring their whatever one-offs, their random cool stuff. Um, and I think it was just like one of those hit close to home mm -hmm. Chicago purchases. And it was, I think everyone was just nervous because they were such like an innovative brewery with, when did Bourbon County come out? Because that was like such a, right, you know, they had all those like good thing. beers and all the, the innovative whatnot. Um, Early 2000s for Bourbon, Bourbon County Stout, I think. They were barrel aging in the 90s. Apparently they, they wow. claimed to have innovated the barrel aging, bourbon barrel aging process. Um, which... I believe it. Yeah, as far as I know. <laughs> like, it was, I mean, they were legit. It seemed like there was always, um, that was kind of the thing to, to watch for there. <laughs> and obviously still, and that was, I guess... I think that was it, like it just really being in Chicago. So they opened in 88, um, the larger brewery in 95, and the second brew pub in Wrigleyville, which is closed, and then it was opened again, I believe, the Wrigleyville one. There was... Or did it ever open again? I thought it opened again. I, mean, I haven't I it's even been down there forever, yeah. And I know there was some issue with the Clybourne one for a while, but I think that's back or it's as, a new, as an independent company. Yeah. Whatever. And that was yeah. part of it. That was kind of what helped them keep the innovation going, I think, is the Clybourne spot where they would still do their one-offs. I always enjoyed going to that place and getting lunch and having all their real random one-off beers. Because mm -hmm. there was so... One of my favorite ambers I had there, I've never been able to find again. Really? It's just kind of a one-off random amber that they made. Mm -hmm. It was just nice and sweet. Uh... I guess I don't remember what else outside of that, but it was just, that's what nice. They always did a lot of one-offs, a lot of cool stuff yeah. that ended up being, um, you know, just get it there. And uh, I think uh, one thing I didn't appreciate until I was looking at the site was, is just how they really did, they do innovate a lot. They st there's a ton of beers on there. Um, you can scroll through for a long time looking at all the different um, styles and, and um, a lot of them, <clears throat> it, just get being used to mostly seeing them in the stores, you know, I know the few visual brands they're working with, um, but uh, yeah, I don't necessarily appreciate how much they really are experimenting with a lot of other things uh, on a smaller scale. And although they're telling that story um, <clears throat> to some extent on Instagram, they're certainly focusing on certain things, but there's... Uh, there's a, here's a beer called Holiday Jam <clears throat> I've never heard of. They have a Noel Belgian Strong Ale um, mm -hmm. that I didn't know they were making, and I would probably go out of my way if to find that again this winter if that if they do that again. <clears throat> uh, I've had some of the Cooper Project. I didn't know they had a porter. I see that on the site, though. Um, I would certainly be open to trying that one. Uh, they're, so they're definitely featuring more of the ones you'll get in the stores, but they're showing you some of the stuff that you might have to um, you might have to go out of your way a little bit to get. I will say as a, as a marketing perspective, they if you scroll down, you're not really seeing, so they talk about the 312 in November, but there's really not, yeah, so sporadically you'll find a 312 post, but then starting in February, um, just really getting into marketing and being consistent, they they start talking about it. February 3rd, they have a, a post with the bowling balls. And then after that, you're almost seeing it every other post leading up to March 12th 
which is just in general a good marketing mm-hmm. thing because you're, everywhere. you're reminding everyone until that day so it really becomes just ingrained oh yeah i gotta drink this <laughs> on the day mm-hmm. and just to turn it into event so i think you know general marketing idea turning your whatever whatever you can turn into an event as much as possible is, is a great way to do it and i think they're they peppered in even with the dry hopped at chicago only so that's what they did exclusively for us is that the 312 dry hop and so you know they continue to be exclusive for us and still not just um trying to keep the entrepreneurial spirit with what they're doing on their mm-hmm. beers and so that's yeah, and they there's fewer videos on um, Instagram. It looks like the, their Facebook page has more little short videos that they're doing uh, that I think are always a fun way to just bring people in, like have you know get people on location in, in one of your pubs or, t- or tasting rooms and uh, see them, see other people, <laughs> you know, show people your people uh, talking about your beers, talking about stuff they're doing. Um, this one is a musician, um, came in before a show or something, um, and they sat down and had a beer first. Um, and I can't remember, there's, uh, there's just some other visuals on uh, Facebook, um, which I think stra- is, is a great strategy just to <clears throat> give people something to, to look at and watch. Uh, while they're thinking about your beer, right. <laughs> basically, you know, um, have them, you know, if, if it's, you know, listening to somebody else talk, a, um, a musician or uh, maybe it's a beer personality. Uh, that's always, you know, something that you will just check out because that's, this what we just call content, right? Just providing real valuable content. It's not necessarily advertising like these other ones that are just shots of the beer. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm always interested in seeing those kinds of posts. Content is king, and they have uh, they do a lot of also uh, um, marking occasions, uh, not necessarily even big occasions. They have you know they had opening day, uh, had several sh- uh, pictures of their beer in different sort of baseball themed um, settings. Uh, they have a first day of spring picture. It's not a very springy picture, <laughs> but uh, they just you know they just acknowledge it. They mark it, uh, so they're kind of there. Um, celebrating with you they do some things with music and um uh there's some other things that they do that are just kind of um finding intersections with people they're interested in um looks like skateboarders i'm not exactly sure what all these skateboards are i think they had a skateboarding show is that it okay um see the, yeah there's themed goose yeah. themed skateboard art yeah that's in honor of 312 day 11 Chicago artists. So they're actually explaining when you when you click into the video, the picture, it'll tell you a little bit about what um, about the artists. They're supporting uh, the Cancer Support Center. Yeah, and so that's artists. turning their um, turning their event, their three one two day, really into a bigger and bigger event. Because obviously, in Dark Lord Day is probably one of the bigger beer events lately. I think it's the most one of the most successful. I mean, they sell mm. out like three minutes but so to try to really respect that people are that interested in beer events and releases it's night and they're doing a good job of really building the community in an event yeah just around i mean a beer that they're doing anyways and so they just <laughs> you may as well i mean mm-hmm. you got saint patty's day the next week but it's still like or right somewhere around there so it's nice to actually have a that they're really making another event about just their beers right and and connecting it to something bigger than them with you know, with art and right um the community with you know cancer support uh it's it's always i know you know it's easy to be cynical about corporations getting involved with charities um on the other hand like you don't have to as a corporation get involved with a charity so to me it's uh it you see plenty of s- smaller microbreweries starting up and almost immediately getting having some kind of cause that they're involved with, and because they're independent, still we we assume their motives are a little more altruistic. Right. Um, and certainly, it's possible when you're when you get to a certain size to have cynical motives. Mm-hmm. Uh, but w- I, you know, 
<laughs> maybe it's just maybe just this the craft the craft guy in me who just wants to give them the benefit of the doubt. They were around. They didn't start as a big corporate right. guy. Like they're looking for people that local ways local community organizations they can support. We don't have to uh, assume there's a cynical motive there. Mm-hmm. And that's true, and it is. Yeah, I think. I don't know. Maybe some places take advantage, and so that's why you you think negatively. But you know, is they're obviously showing that they're keeping their their brand uh, entrepreneurial, and they're doing these creative things. And so you know, why why be negative, especially if they're going to try and help out you know some people? So that's I think that's a good thing as well. If you're helping other people, you're helping other you know. <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> like it is, it's awesome. It's good for them, you know. Thank, mm-hmm. Thanks to, to helping out people in that. Now, one thing I think is interesting that they're doing also, um, which you can see very much in the visual uh, brand online, uh, and you can certainly see it on the shelves. Uh, there's a lot of there are a lot of different beers that fall under their umbrella, even in the again, even on the store shelf, uh, that, and they all look very different. Um, I heard somebody. Um, on a beer podcast kind of going like um, every time, you know, they keep changing some of their, you know, their core brand designs and uh, you start worrying, like, are they (laughs) going to start like just confusing people too much? Um, And, and I get a little bit of that, like the Fulton street series, like I'm still not, like, I know it's separate. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know if I really could tell you what it is um, other than, they're, they seem pretty experimental, and sometimes I'm interested, and sometimes I'm not. Uh, I know then they have their sort of Belgian-style um, series that they're definitely kind of marking at a, um, I would consider like more traditional craft kind of price, uh, uh, price point and um, even uh, presentation. And uh, and you can see on the um, labels here, they got the, the gold embossed um, logo. Um, and on the on the or is it silver? Silver. Um, <clears throat> and uh, they're doing that, and then you have like their their mainline IPA Honkers three one two, which those they keep kind of notching down um, price wise, and they're getting bigger and bigger packs. And so I was reading Sam Calagione of Dogfish Head saying like you know Dogfish Head's not going to try to compete on price. We're not going to participate in the commodification of beer. Um, if you start doing that, like, then you're just saying, like, you're basically saying that the big guys are setting the rules because uh, they are always going to win the price game. Uh, and I think it's a, that is a really interesting question to me when you have somebody like Goose who's going, who's trying, tr- trying to live in both worlds. Um, mm-hmm. They're making, they're still making Bourbon County, although now you can get a, the bottle of the regular Bourbon County for, it came out at, like, 12 bucks or something, um, and uh, which is not really that and and i can still find them. I've see, i saw some in, in the store the other day actually yeah. <laughs> uh, you can still find them so it's not it's not nearly as rare as they used to be um so even like i, w- I wonder if that brand is going to start to feel a little less um uh elite or or premium uh you look on their instagram page and you can see 312 as this sort of like Here's 312 and IPA and four star all in like cans in a pile here. And then you have Sophie, a bottle of Sophie and like a, on a table with like roses around it. Yeah. And, uh, like really trying to straddle both these worlds. Uh, they are they are participating in sort of that putting pressure on smaller guys to try to keep their beers at a price point that is some, might be hard for them to do. Um, but they're also participating in still creating n- good higher end beers that are worth spending more on. Uh, and I don't know if there's a question in there <laughs> so much as just thinking out loud about somebody who's trying right. to kind of be both. And, um, we're, we're ballpark beer, but we're also, uh, like a, a, a fine dining beer, right. Uh, or we have something for both of those occasions. I think that's, I don't know. So far they're doing it right. And I think it'll, um, It'll, that'll be more of those time will tell, I think, how it actually plays out because, you know, just figuring it out uh, or actually trying to make an assessment on what they'll actually do is just really, it, I think it'll be one day if consumers decide that they're over it, you know, then then 
I think that's kind of at least what they're doing in, in the smart way is that they're kind of positioning themselves to take advantage of whatever move happens. That if people are still interested in, in getting some of the nicer beers, they're definitely still showing up with some, I mean, this is a really, you know, it's a really good beer. And so it's, it's worth paying a little more for this stuff. And then, you know, if you see this stuff, it, it's kind of commodification of it. When if it's the 12 pack or the 18 pack or whatever they, I think it's just 12 packs, right? They, uh, they have 15s. I saw 15. Yeah. So, you know, and then those are going to work on, on some of the summer days. And so that's, that's where your consumer, I think will end up telling you if they're sick of this stuff, if they don't want to, to get any more, or if they just want to go with the, the drinkable stuff. And it's, yeah. And I think the, so the, the challenge is really just how do you start to think about, I, I guess I'd be, I'd be interested in hearing from somebody at Goose there. Um, if they're, I don't know if they're working with an agency or if they have a, a some in-house, an in-house team, uh, are they thinking about one consumer who drinks the whole range of beers or do, are they actually like thinking about several kinds of consumers? Uh, it's because it's probably true even just looking at what they like actually well let me put it this way like those Sophie images with the roses don't do anything for me but I know Sophie is a good beer and I like drinking it right. and in fact like one I was thinking about this with the merger and, and uh, what it, as a consumer like has it had has it actually had an effect on me um, I don't know that I, my drinking habits have changed that much I'll still if I see something new of theirs I'll still, still check it out uh, and, but it, what it does mean is that at Wrigley Field, I can get a Sophie <laughs> or a Matilda. Uh, and if I'm already spending eight bucks just to get a, a goose IPA to spend another buck or two, or whatever it is to get the, the Matilda, it's like, well, what the heck? <laughs> so that to me is an interesting, uh, consequence of this merger is that, uh, I can drink nice, much nicer beers than I normally would at the ballpark. <laughs> uh, which is a win. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it seems like a win for everybody. Uh, <clears throat> so, yeah, do you think about that as, as one consumer or multiple consumers? Uh, I could see going either direction because I do think we're starting to think of the craft consumer as more flexible right. uh, than, than they used to be. And so you're seeing the light lagers coming out and craft brewers themselves are kind of saying, well, sometimes we drink light lagers on shift because – we got we can keep working right. <laughs> while we're doing it. Um, so that's that's interesting to think about, and, and kind of now thinking about that avatar and putting the beer in different situations, different beers in different situations, in order to say like, let's think about more like when you drink this or where you drink this, rather than like what kind of person are you. Mm -hmm. um, and that I think would be an, it could be an interesting direction. Uh, I'm not sure if that's I'm not sure I get it. I'm getting that as such from what I'm looking at, but uh, it might be an interesting way to think about how you have such a broad range of styles and and still just have one Instagram page. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They're, I mean, they are doing it nice. I, I see exact. I mean, that's a valid, valid point. I think they're, um, I don't know, they're kind of doing it right. It does seem like they are really aiming more towards that everyday drinker oh, yeah. on the Instagram. You know, well, that's than, where you get the volume, right? <laughs> uh, exactly. So yeah. that's so that could be their their plan. So just like peppering in the Sophies and the and the the pricier one offs as like those people that have been really enjoying the the pails or the three one twos, and they're like, well, let's give it a shot if it's on a special draft or somewhere. Because that helps too. So, finish this right, and move let's on. Let's kill it. All right. That's a good one. It yeah. really is nice. All right. So, this is the Apex Predator and. From Off Color. From Off Color Brewing in Logan Square. They're calling it a third trophic level farmhouse ale. Did not look up what they mean by that. <laughs> Trophic level. Maybe that means it won a, the prime means it won a third place medal. Oh, yeah. Bronze. That's awesome. <laughs> Using big words to sell your humor. Yeah. 
So a lot of their, especially as packaging is concerned, they're, I mean, this is the general label design that they have, this kind of black and white drawings mm-hmm. um, with the mouse. I know he's on the side of the brew house. Yeah, it's the grain mouse. Uh, yeah. And they actually have a, a short FAQ or if you want to call it that, on, on their webpage where they talk about the you know, why the grain mouse, and they say something like, oh, he's the only thing that's there more often than we are, or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so then, and they actually, we can, we can get into that a little bit, but uh, that the mouse shows up in a lot of places, and then the mouse has, like, a, a brother. <laughs> uh, and then, you know, there's... Um, and there's a cat involved, uh, and I think they actually do have cats in their brewery. Empirical does too. Maybe I'm getting confused. Pipeards does too. Do I they? Believe. Okay, uh, probably for the mice. Let's try it out. Yeah, it's, it's very floral, a little citrusy. So already that drinks a lot. Like um, not less bite. There's less bite. Yeah, it's a little smoother, probably stiller. Um, not not as quite as carbonated as the other one. Yeah, is part of that. Pills, flaked wheat, honey malt. It's definitely yeah less bite than the um, than the Sophie. More of a really fairly smooth. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's a lot <clears throat> a lot of easier drinking. So. And this is interesting to think about. I mean, if, if the Cezanne style, the country style, the farmhouse style, um, basically means like what you brew for your farm hands, mm-hmm. in some ways it's a little ironic to like make it like a six and a half percent <laughs> to make it like a yeah higher ABV barrel aged. Um, right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> even as a year round, it's still like it's a nicer it's a, it's a nicer sort of special occasion. Um, uh, more closer to a special occasion beer you're buying it in a four pack. Um, I think they used to do the uh, predators in six packs. Um, this is actually also six and a half percent. But uh, I could see this being something that you might have a couple more easily like just because it doesn't it, it doesn't have the same kind of um bite in your mouth i can see having more of these at a, at a right. session um, at a time uh, in that ironic <laughs> thing um you know just a statement about it i also wonder if this is i wonder if that's also like where they changed it so yes the so the original idea was so um as, as Brad just said, you basically give it, you brewed it at a lower ABV as like the lawnmower beers, as they call them, right? Like your sessions that you just, you can drink more without, <laughs> without having to worry about too much were six and a half percent. I think, I wonder if that became a consumer or like a choice to kind of go towards the consumer that you saw that they're really just more interested in the pails. And then, so they're just like, well, let's just up Let's make this a special beer mm-hmm. because people aren't as interested in drinking, you know, because it's not right. guilty. I, this isn't my first choice that I always go and grab a farmhouse. You know, I, I had a phase, a farmhouse phase. Yeah. But, you know, um, and so I wonder if that also kind of dictated what they ended up doing and then making it a little more special because it's not the go-to for everybody. So then you kind of up, upscale, up market it to be a four pack that you you know spend a little more on kind of mm-hmm. yeah that could be that makes sense uh well because the other thing you have to do then is uh some you know consumer education really uh because and that was for me the the sort of hurdle to get into is like what is this farmhouse thing um and for me it seems like i was starting to pay attention to them only somewhat recently last couple of years and uh, and, and right around the same time the sours were coming out and I was, I was getting them confused for a little bit. Uh, it says, I'm going to be sour. I don't know if I like sours yet. Mm-hmm. Um, and then as I started trying more and actually like learning more about it and realizing that it's, it's, it's one of these like, um, very amorphous categories. <laughs> That's a, like you could anywhere you go in Europe, they're making Cezanne's, uh, it's probably not going to have a whole lot in common. Right. Um, but, uh, but just sort of, I think the American version tends to be, you know, a lighter color, mm-hmm. um, a lighter 
drinking beer with um, citrus and peppery qualities, um, such as both of these had, uh, although they're in other ways really different. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> in a good way. Uh, so, yeah, I think that the education part is something that um, to jump right into thinking about like how they're telling their story. These guys, I've had, a, I checked these guys out when I first launched as a freelance, a freelancer a couple of years ago. And, uh, uh, and I was like, I like the stuff you do. You have an interesting visual thing going on. I don't feel like you're telling your story well, ver- verbally. I didn't say it that as much, but, um, that's where I was at. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I chatted with, um, I can't remember who I was speaking with now, but, uh, uh, you know, they, they were happy basically is what it came down. They were happy with what they had going on. Uh, and I think they have reason to be happy with the, vi- with the, the visual, the, um, if you look on the shelves, you see the black and white, it's, it's distinctive. Mm-hmm. Um, it, the line drawings, there's, uh, they're compelling and, and then when you pick them up and start looking at them, they give you lots of um, just enough sort of information to geek out on uh, in terms of what you're looking at, gravity, IBUs. Right. Uh, they list secret techniques here, uh, free-rise fermentation and prey selection. Uh, that's If you want to learn more, you can learn a little bit more if you go online about what that means. Um, but here's the thing. That's actually, I think, really interesting about this beer. And I don't, it's not even on the bottom here. No. This beer, they, uh, to produce this, they turned off, uh, I think, I think they made their wort. And then, um, instead of like controlling the temperature, like you would normally do and getting it down to just the right place to pitch your yeast, they just turned off all the temperature controls threw the yeast in and like left it just to see what would happen. <laughs> and it came out with a really nice Cezanne, <laughs> very, very drinkable. And it became, it's one of their flagship like year round beers. Uh, so this free rise fermentation is what they're describing as sort of just like, I guess, letting the yeast kind of figure out its own place in the beer right. <laughs> instead of trying to control it with uh, temperature like you normally would. Uh, like, I don't know, I don't know that that's what's happening just from reading the bottle. And actually, I'm not sure if it's a real thing reading the bo- bottle because I'm guessing prey selection has more to do with the drawing of a lion um, or possibly the, you know, than it does with, with anything specific about the beer. So mm-hmm. uh, I think, like, that kind of thing is a missed opportunity to me, like, looking at, like, who they are. And just I was thinking about this also with um, I had to go to their wiki to learn that it is actually um, part of their self-concept that they want to brew forgotten styles of beer. Now, I kind of figured that out on my own because <laughs> just by looking at what they're doing. <laughs> right. But you can't find that by looking on their website. On the website, they say, uh, we brew beer and sometimes we do other stuff, but we're not as good at it. Right. Uh, that's what they say on the website, and so there's a feeling. Um, I got a, obviously I got a bit of a beef with these guys, <laughs> I because I actually like a lot of their beers. I really like these guys, and so I want to see them really standing up for their beers a little bit more in the in the verbal brand. Um, we brew beer, like okay, but so does everybody else. Um, you guys don't just brew beer; you brew. You're you're resurrecting forgotten styles right. of beer. I mean, that's cool. That's a niche. That's that is, not yeah. not everybody's doing that. Um, and not, I I didn't look. I didn't like study super closely, but I believe you haven't gotten on the IPA train. Uh, which hats off if you can survive <laughs> right now without having an IPA. Uh, then you're doing something right. Right. And I think a lot of where they're making where, where they're succeeding is just they. They're finding their people through the socials, um, which is important. That's, that's obviously a huge way to do it. Uh, I just wonder, like, if they could be doing so much more if they just were just, like, pushing a little harder on that level of, like, we are doing these. Like, we don't necessarily think beer is just barley hops. Yeast. That's actually part of it. It's, not, it's like pre Ryan Heights go boat. Um, we might, you know, you don't necessarily have to use hops. Right. Um, so they have a chicha style uh, inspired beer. I think it does have some hops in it, but um, 
that kind of stuff is really interesting as a part of who you are as a, as a brewery, as a niche that you're picking out and trying to make a stand in. Uh, and some people are going to figure that out, but people who don't know what a farmhouse is, don't know what a teacher is, uh, you're not, you got to pull them in somehow. Right. Um, and hopefully the, hopefully for the time being, the, the artwork is doing it because the artwork again is <laughs> very compelling. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I just think there's a lot more story that, that um, they could be telling. Yeah, I agree. And that is that being the niche and being, I mean, that is the story, you know, like, yeah, being the niche, bringing back <laughs> uh, beers that everyone's forgotten about that, uh, when they began, operation was a focus on brewing forgotten styles of beer. I mean, that's like a slogan, the, the yeah. story that they, you know, here's another forgotten beer. Here's our, and, and that's beautiful. Because then it does, you know, it kind of, it makes you respect them a little more and just want to, because then you're really curious as to what the heck they're doing. If you, right, you poke around their website, you might get the feeling that they're just sort of, um, they, they, both, of, both of the founders worked at other breweries and they um i think one of them was went to siebel um they interned at metropolitan like they've got they they know what they're doing um and so you learn that from reading the site but you kind of get the feeling that they're kind of like playing and running a brewery um, and that playfulness is fun when you're tiny uh, to grow i don't know if it's if that will sustain you to grow um, beyond that sort of community of early adopters who are excited because you were new. Um, when you have a, a really cool story, and you're doing these collaborations. They have the Tooth and Claw. They, it was a collaboration with the Field Museum. They did um, the Chicha was a collaboration with the Field Museum. Um, they're trying. They did a, um, a Finnish-style sati. Like, who's doing that? <laughs> uh, they're doing all these really interesting things. Um do and they have a sampler pack? I don't think they do yet, actually. But that, yeah, that could be really interesting. That would they would probably have one of the most interesting sampler packs. R right, absolutely. <laughs> Just literally I six would, different styles. You're right. Yeah, it snatched that up immediately. <laughs> That's yeah. what they need. That That's what be, they need a variety pack. Because yeah. it's especially to. Because with the tagline, I mean, that's a good way to just mm – because -hmm. someone – who wants to buy a six-pack of goes when you've never had it? Right. You know, and you're going to be like, eh, these well, are, I don't want to spend $12. Some of these things are a little scary if you don't know what they are. Right. Yeah. Like 10 12 whatever it is, like it can be a little intimidating to just buy the sixer of that. Yeah. But if you can at least get one – I know, actually, I think I got some of theirs from a make a six-pack. That's where I kind yep. of started getting involved right. with them. That's a good place to try them out. And so, you know – Put that in front of people, especially with such, such weird, not just offbeat um, styles. It would mm -hmm. be a cool way to really expose people. Yeah, this, yeah, it's they're a really they're a fun, interesting brewery. Lots of things I, I, I will almost always try something, especially if I can find it in the mix and match. Right, I'll, I'll grab it um, because because you know, they are. It's like somebody who's doing that much. Um, that's sort of off the the beaten path, let's say. Um, it's outside of the normal styles we're familiar with. Uh, at some point, any beer drinker is going to be like, yeah, this is not for me, right? <laughs> right? This is not the one. Um, but because all their beers are so different and because they're, they're playing with so many different styles, like you can't know for sure that because you didn't like this one that you're not, that, you know, whether you're going to like an, the next one. That could literally, yeah, just be one. That's yeah. You know, so. Not sitting right. So, yeah, I, these guys, I think, are just so interesting and um, have so much to offer. And and I lo I'm, I'm glad to see the stuff that they're, they are doing, I think, pretty well online with just telling some of their story um, of sort of what's going on around the brewery. Uh, just, just odd shots of, like, you know, people moving beer around, people hanging out. They uh, did a, a silly thing with this um, 15 feet, um, I think it's a, I can't remember what style it is. Um, <clears throat> it's a smoked beer, um, and smoked beers are really interesting. Um, so I would, it's certainly something I'm interested in checking out. Uh, and then they did a, a collaboration with Miller yeah. Brewing, which <laughs> I think was a little surprising for everybody. Um, but uh, again, like that's the kind of stuff that they're doing, where it's just a lot of it's just unexpected. You're not sure what to think about it. So. Uh, 
it's fun to look at online in order to like, how do you get somebody going from like, Hey, it's fun to kind of watch and see you do weird things. And you have an interesting label to I actually want to like put, spend money to put this in my mouth. Right. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. So they're telling, I mean, on their Instagram, I mean, they're definitely telling a story. They're showing a lot more than goose. They are showing a bit more of people, cats, yeah. different beers, what's, which I think what's going on just around, around the, their shop. And that helps sell it, and it helps showing them as the smaller experimental guys, I think, and yeah, showing that they're doing speaking events, it looks like, too. So well, that's, yeah, and that's the kind of thing I like to see, actually, with any brewery is, it, you know, if you have somebody who's really good at photography, like, by all means, use that person. Um, but it doesn't have to be professional-grade photography all the time. Um, you, you want to bring that person around to like take some nice shots for you so you can be posting those as well. But just that sort of, you know, having a person or two who, when they walk around the brewery, just kind of just shoot stuff. Um, I think, especially when you're really, when you have to emphasize the local so much as a brewery, uh, like that's the kind of thing that makes you feel like you start to get to know these people right. and they're approachable. Um, and again, especially when you're, you, you want to be as approachable as possible in as many f- formats, <laughs> visual and verbal. And um, when your beer itself is um, uh, potentially a little, you know, people might be a little cautious about it. Right. Yeah. So you like the guys, you see them enough, yeah. and you're like, you know what, he's, I like the stuff that he's doing. He's really cool. Yeah. I want to try his stuff. Yeah. yeah. I got to check this out. Kind of like your becomes your friend, uh, in essence, and so you really want to support them. And so I think that is a... Uh, I think they're doing it. They could always, I mean, you could always do more. I don't, I don't even know how much. Basically one a day, which is, one a day is fairly standard. I think you can sometimes get away if you have a lot of cool stuff, you know. It's okay to do multiples, and which I guess they also have with the sliding, the slideshows and whatnot. Mm-hmm. But I, I would guess from just what I'm seeing here, they don't necessarily have a... Um They've had a couple campaigns, like they have the Eek campaign, um, and maybe they're hyper. Uh, but uh, it doesn't look to me like there's necessarily a, uh, like whereas Goose was clearly, like they had a 312 campaign. Right. Um, this, yeah, this there's less of a sense of like, there's something we're moving towards or looking forward to, or some kind of like theme this month, or... Um, you know, whatever it is, it's something that draws together the various posts, um, or that sort of is a through line that might pass, you know, through a month or a quarter or something. Uh, that's those, a, that's a valid point. Go ahead. Yes, yeah, I was just gonna expand on that. Just being is something that, like, if you get people, especially the really devoted people, um, tracking with you, uh, it'll help to kind of create some coherence, you know, and 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 it allows you to develop the story over over time. Right. And I agree. It's, that's glad you even said that. That's um, it is something that they might want to even look at to help educate even more on mm-hmm. these different styles too. Yeah. So spend right. your two weeks talking about the goes or these other styles Absolutely. that no one has any idea about, and just build that intrigue. Mm-hmm. Whether it's literally pouring the glass or mm-hmm. just educating on or both you pour in the yeah. glass and educating on what the heck it is and build it out started. short video you can do some instagram posts just pictures of it have a blog post about it or you know maybe like a page that's like here's our sour styles or here's our belgian styles or whatever it is and you know you know find some places where you can multiple places people can find you online and learn something about uh about what you're doing Especially tasting videos, too. I feel like those are, especially for the brewers, that would be, like, such a cool thing. I know for any brewer that makes the beer, like, just get in front of a camera or your phone and just, like, see, talk about the beer that you made. You know, try and keep it to a minute or two minutes if, mm-hmm. you, if you must <laughs> just to do something. But, you know, that would be so cool because yeah. then it helps sell the story. You would learn. I'm sure the guy's passion is going to come off into actually talking about the beer. So yeah. it's like... Oh, yeah, that's interesting. I'm intrigued. Right. And that'll kind of just, those videos would probably sell a good chunk as it is, Mm -hmm. you know, just getting intrigued from him enjoying it and not having, 
or maybe with someone else it gets a weird face you know like from the sour that they didn't <laughs> right. expect and then he explains that and then you're like oh so that's why I want to like it and so yeah and then you know what I and mean, you could build on that I mean you could create a hashtag about you know what are some kind of off color tasting or something and then invite your community to say like okay bring bring one of our beers to one of your friends who's never tried it right yeah, that's true. and then film them trying it and talking about it right and um especially like find somebody or to bring it to your grandpa's house who like doesn't you know just right. to, and even if he doesn't like it it's going to be an entertaining video right, right. if he spits it out oh this is swill uh or whatever uh cuz it's you know it's not his high life or whatever is his uh rolling rock um you know what I, like i mean that's just kind of fun stuff you can get people to do and then yeah. it's a way to kind of also kind of say it's like the the off color challenge you know? yeah, <laughs> like exactly. like try this beer you've never heard of <laughs> so that's, and there's fun things you could do with it that's very true and you could build it as that and then especially if you're in front of that just not afraid of the people that are right the right like just weirded out then it shows you have the good sense of humor and then you can help them. and you know you're not for everybody and you're not trying to be for everybody yeah and that's fine and that's fine yeah so Nice. I think uh, they're yeah they're doing a good job. I think uh, storytelling even more would just help them out even just educate more on your labels and or, and your special beers because that'll just that'll build the intrigue. So yeah. Any, cool. any last words from you? Uh, I think I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Mm. That's beer. That's really nice. It's very smooth. All right, we have our outro. Oh, yeah. All right, professional podcasters. <laughs> intro and outro. <laughs> All right. That wraps up this episode. You've been listening to Two Beers and a Podcast with Brad and Mike. If you like what you heard, please give us a rating at iTunes uh, or whatever podcatcher you're using. If you have an idea for a topic and a pairing, drop us a line on Twitter at, at Two Beers Pod. If you want to learn more about our video, web, and social media marketing service, you can also find us on Twitter at, at Two Beers Pod. Direct message us, and we'll be happy to get in touch. Thank you. We need like a nice uh, beer themed sign. Was it really? I didn't think we were going to get that long. Welcome.